In the 90s, technology was advancing fast. Computers were getting stronger and more powerful and becoming an ever-growing part of everyday life. And for a lot of people, it was moving too fast. In the busy life of an adult, you found what worked and you stuck to it. You didn't have time to learn how to use a new, complicated, and intimidating tool. Computers weren't as user-friendly as they are now. If you did something wrong, you could damage a seriously expensive machine. With this new, daunting world of technology on the horizon, a lot of parents realized that it was best to introduce their kids to computers while they were still young, and had time to get comfortable with the new technology the way adults didn't. Enter Disney Interactive. In 1994, Disney was at the height of its popularity, with its renaissance of animated films in full swing. Practically every little kid ate off of Disney dishes, slept in Disney pajamas, and breathed Disney air. So why not, the Disney company thought, if kids are on computers, have them play Disney games as well. They saw the growing market for educational kids' computer games and partnered with developers like Media Station and Griffin Software. Disney set to work on creating interactive CD-ROM games for Windows and Mac based on all their most popular properties. With parents looking to get their kids comfortable with computers and Disney looking to expand its massive media empire into the world of gaming, it was like a match made in heaven. These things sold like hotcakes and literally everyone I knew had them growing up. I was playing these before I even knew what video games were, and whether I realized it back then or not, they were my first real taste of gaming and computers. And I think that's true for a lot of kids my age, so I find it surprising that not many people still talk about them today. They were in pretty young, for ages 4 to 8, so maybe it was just too narrow an age range for them to be widely remembered. But hey, since I just so happened to have grown up with them myself, today I'm going to show you a few of these Disney interactive games that were a staple of childhood in the 90s. There were dozens of these things released in a variety of different formats, from activity centers, to animated storybooks, to edutainment titles, to print shops, and more. So I'm just going to show you a few of the ones that I remember the most fondly. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but I get the feeling we're not going to be able to run a lot of these on my modern rig. We're going to need something a bit older, a bit clunkier. Oh, Tinkerbell! Now that's more like it. First, let's take a look at one of the Activity Center type games. This one is based on Toy Story, and it's more of a collection of mini games than anything else. The first thing you'll notice is that this game features a ton of original animation. For all of these games, Disney worked closely with the developers, contributing thousands of frames of original animation and hundreds of music files and voice recordings. In this case, because Toy Story featured 3D animation, the game was actually developed entirely in-house at Pixar. It looks pretty good for a game released in 1996, don't you think? Like most of these games, it starts out by asking you to create a save file by typing in your name. Then it introduces you to the most ubiquitous of all features, the menu icon. All of these games have one, and in this case, it takes the shape of a bouncy ball. It's mostly just there to give you help if you need it, repeat instructions, or allow you to quit the game easily, since the games ran full screen. It's a really pretty good, simple interface, but they painstakingly remind you it's there on every single screen of the game, so you better get used to hearing about it. That little ball in the corner, that little ball in the corner, that little ball in the, that little ball in the corner can be a big help. To learn more about it, just click the question mark twice. Woody then launches into a long-winded introduction of all the areas you can play. Can you feel the excitement building? It's becoming pretty obvious that the voice of Woody in this isn't Tom Hanks, but a lot of the actors from the movie do actually reprise their roles, like Jim Varney, Wallace Shawn, and John Rosenberger. And if that's not Tim Allen as Buzz, then it's a really good sound like. I am Buzz Lightyear. I come in peace. There are three main areas of the game, Andy's room, Pizza Planet, and Sid's house, with three minigames per area. Let's try out Slinky's game of five in a row first. It's basically like Connect Four, except five. This game is for eight-year-olds tops, so I think I'll be all right on the hardest difficulty. I... I lost? Damn, I guess maybe I underestimated how hard the computer would be. Okay, well, surely on the second difficulty setting. Are you kidding me? They gotcha again! Remember, the object of the game is to get five of your pieces in a row and block the other team from getting five in a row. I'm not an idiot, Woody. I understand how the game is played. I'm just getting my ass kicked by a game for elementary school kids. I can't tell if the AI here is actually difficult or if I just really suck at this. Fine, you know what? I'll try on easy. Finally! Wow, I wasn't expecting to have my ego bruised this early on. Let's try a different activity. I remember this one being my favorite as a kid, Sums Up With Ham. Basically, it's like blackjack, only instead of 21, you have to reach 39 without going over. And also, there's no gambling. Obviously. This time, I'm not risking my pride. Let's just start on the easiest difficulty. I should be able to win on easy, right? 13! 
59! Son of a- Okay, you know what? Let's just go to Pizza Planet. I remember the stuff there being more puzzle-based, and we can play some games that I can't actually lose. This game is making me feel stupid. I remember this being my least favorite area as a kid, probably because it's a bit boring compared to the rest of the game. The only activities here are a Simon memory game with these ugly slurpy machines that make fun of you even when you win, and a little 3D puzzle game. I remember being pretty disappointed that the claw machine game didn't actually have anything to do with the aliens from the movie. It's just pipes and darkness, and I found it creepy as a kid. At least I can solve this one on the hardest difficulty, though. There's also a theater where you can watch compressed clips from the movie, but this never worked on my computer back in the day. That's the thing about these games. A lot of the time, it was hard to get them to run correctly. They were all created on tight budgets and even tighter schedules, often to line up with holidays or movie releases. So even though they tended to look and sound pretty good, they often sacrifice performance. Between this, hardware compatibility issues, and the fragile nature of discs, there are problems with audio dropouts, crashes, freezes, and parts of the game loading slowly. So there were some areas that just never worked right, and I learned to avoid. Like this one activity in Sid's house where you can mix your own sounds and songs using a selection of audio clips. The playback just doesn't work. It'll play maybe one or two sounds and then stop, and when I tried to leave the activity afterwards, suddenly all the sound in the game stopped working. I had to restart the game to fix it, and even though that long introduction from Woody was charming enough the first time, it's unskippable, and it plays every single time you start the game, new save file or no. Speaking of Sid's house, there's one activity here that I remember incredibly vividly, because it terrified me as a little kid. It's this toy creator, where you take pieces of mutilated toy parts and put them together to form your own hybrid creations, or follow the blueprints and make pre-designed toys. When you complete a toy and click the clamp, it dances across the screen. But I think this is the scariest part of all. The toy parts are all fully animated, but individually. So the way the toys move is just uncanny and totally creepy. Not helped by the fact that they're all in pre-rendered 3D in an era where that was really new territory. Just look at this. No wonder I was scared of this game as a kid. I find it pretty eerie even now, honestly. If you do follow the blueprints, though, and make the toys that the game has come up with for you, you get some unique pre-render dances that don't look nearly as bad. Even though this section scared the crap out of me, I remember playing it the most often. I guess I was trying to desensitize myself to it, to conquer my fears and play it until it wasn't scary anymore. And in a way, it worked. I got comfortable with it the more I forced myself to play it, and I remember showing this part of the game off to my friends when they'd come over, just to prove how not scared of it I was. Next up, we have the animated storybooks. We had a ton of these back in the day, but for some reason my favorite was the 101 Dalmatians game. These games retell the story of the film on which they're based in a point-and-click kind of way, with each screen containing about a paragraph of text and a scene from the story. Roger needed a mate, but if I had left it up to him, we would have been bachelors forever. I had my eye on a pretty lady across the street. I also had my eye on that lady's Dalmatian. Each chunk of text contains clickable words that help teach vocabulary by showing synonyms or definitions, and each scene has about a dozen or so clickable objects that make little superfluous animations play out. They're pretty similar to most of those living books games, but they have a bigger focus on interactivity. When you're done screwing around in each scene, you click on the door to make the plot advance to the next scene, or click on special objects to play minigames, like this one where you match the dogs to their owners in their apartments. Brutus. There are also sing-alongs in some parts of the game, activated by clicking on special musical objects. Because the original movie 101 Dalmatians isn't a musical like most of Disney's later fare, this game features original songs recorded just for this adaptation, it's nice that they went the extra mile, but none of these songs are especially memorable or good. Animals are cute. They make a lovely suit, like an alligator boot on a bearskin rug. Rabbits, I just love for the lining in my glove. And along with the above, I love ermine, a lynx, a leopards, a lynx, a zebra skin or elk will do, coyote, beaver, badger too, a possum, squirrel, raccoon, and deer. I don't care, just bring them here! Curiously missing from this list, leather. Apparently, it's only bad if she kills the cute animals for fur. So you just play through the game, clicking on random stuff, and watching the story happen. For whatever reason, a lot of the interactive elements in this particular story involve just making a huge mess. <laughs> 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 
And a lot of the time, they take whatever sense of urgency the story had and slam it into a brick wall. Like right now, the puppies have just been kidnapped. So we're at a bit of a low point in the story, and Pongo and Purdy are sending out the Twilight Bark to try to get the other dogs in London to help them. But everything clickable on this page is just goofy. We get this weird dog translator gauge where you can listen to the dogs in the city have conversations in dog language, human language, or half human and half dog. <laughs> Well, I guess sometimes you just gotta be a bitch. <laughs> and the song you get by clicking on the radio tower in this scene is an upbeat number about all the different types of dogs out there. Way to completely ruin the tension. Again, for the most part, the things I remember about this game is the stuff I found scary, which is why I find it odd that my mom tells me that this one was my favorite. My most vivid memories of these games are always the parts that just horrified me. Maybe this was another one of those areas that I played a lot to try to conquer my fear. There's this part where we need to rescue the puppies from Cruella's mansion by playing a hidden object game. For some reason, the fact that this house was so dirty and cluttered and dark just creeped me out like crazy as a kid. I guess because there weren't any characters on screen, I felt like I was really alone in this unsafe, spooky place, and it was too much for little four-year-old me, to the point where I would usually just skip this part of the game altogether. But that wasn't really a problem, because even though this minigame is actually part of the story, you can just skip anything you want with no consequences. The game will sometimes act like you're helping if you do things like disguise the puppies as Labradors by covering them in soot, but if you don't, the story carries on anyway acting like you helped, so every little click is treated almost like a special surprise, or an easter egg that you were just so clever for finding out. The adaptation is usually pretty faithful, but they seem to have taken some liberties with the source material for this one. While the movie took place in the early 60s, here we can see big screen TVs, VHS tapes, personal computers. Oh, and apparently instead of a composer, Roger is now a game developer. Roger, John here. Roger, I realize you call yourself a video game designer. <laughs> but this game idea you sent us is any indication you should really think about another line of work, shouldn't you? I mean, a game called Fun with Algebra is not exactly what kids are looking for. And evidently, not a very good one. Hello. I know you're going to enjoy this game, Fetch. I created it. These controls are terrible. It plays sort of like Pac-Man, where you have to navigate a maze by collecting certain objects and staying away from Cruella, but it's not fun at all to play. You control it only by moving the mouse, and the puppy seems to take your input as a mere suggestion rather than a rule. I never played this part as a kid, and I can only assume it's because I had no idea how to control it. Also, can we talk about the fact that Roger and Anita are just like, cool, let's just keep 101 unplanned puppies in the house. Are you crazy? You know they're going to grow up to be like big giant Dalmatian dogs, right? The rest of the animated storybooks are pretty similar, like this Hercules one. It begins with a little abridged version of the opening song from the movie and an intro from Two of the Muses. Get ready to hear the true story of the greatest hero of all, Hercules! Uh, you wanna run that by me again? It has the same setup where it shows you a little paragraph and a scene from the story, and you can click on the text to get vocab lessons. Hera. Hera was queen of the gods for the Greeks long ago. Here's two more things about her you may want to know. Hera was the wife of Zeus, and in our story, she was Hercules' mother. And here are some other things you might want to know. Honestly, aside from that though, this one is pretty boring overall. I think maybe because the story of Hercules is probably the least good and least interesting thing about it as a film, aside from picking it apart for plot holes. You get her out, she goes, you stay forever. Huh? You, you, you can't be alive. You, oh. no! Get her out. She goes. You stay. The best one of these games, though, is the Mulan animated storybook. This was one of the last ones to come out, and I think for that reason, I maybe didn't play it as much as the others. But it took the interactivity to a whole new level. In this one, it adds a bit of a meta narrative about these magic scrolls that tell the tale of Mulan and Mushu drops them all over China and the magic falls out. So now you have to go to each scene of the story and click on things to make the plot progress and fill the story back in. 
It still has a lot of the same format, where there's a bit of text with vocab that you can click on on each page, but now there's a lot more incentive to click around, because you have to fill in the next part of the story yourself as you go. I'm kind of busy. Uh, can you help me collect good luck charms for Mulan? Oh man, now there's crickets everywhere! You are most kind. You collected all the good luck charms. The whole thing is narrated by an Eddie Murphy impersonator who doesn't do a terrible job, and George Takei reprises his role as the head ancestor, who also narrates the paragraphs. Succeed. Grandma Fa collected good luck charms. So you get to hear a lot of his wonderful, smooth, booming voice throughout the game. The mini games this time around are some of the best in the series, too. This first one is a nice dress up game where you get to dress Mulan for her meeting with a matchmaker, and you can actually print the outfits in Mulan out to make your own paper dolls. Of course, the game does still ultimately ignore whatever outfit you pick and go with the canon one for the story, but there are still lots of choices, and you can even dress up Mushu too if you want. A lot of the time, it's not quite as simple as just clicking on the right objects. It plays a bit more like an adventure game, where you need to solve certain puzzles in the scene to continue. Not super difficult puzzles or anything, mind you, but it's still a lot more fun than just screwing around and clicking on stuff until you get bored enough to move on. On this page, you have to knock the scroll out of a tree by using a ball, and then you have to click on the tiles until they match to open the chest to get the suit of armor. And then you gotta pack Mulan's bag while fending off little brother in real time by throwing a ball for him to chase, or he'll knock all the items back out. So it feels a lot more like playing an actual game, compared to the previous ones that felt more like picture books. The best part of the game, hands down, is in the army camp. This Mahjong minigame is the bomb. It's a real full-fledged game of Mahjong, where you can play on your own, play with a friend, or play against one of the NPCs on four difficulties. And there's no question here that the AI is just perfect. First of all, if you play against Yao, he's really voiced by Harvey Firestein. You think that was pretty good? Well, let's see if you can do it again. In what other game can you play Mahjong with Harvey Firestein? Second of all, level 4 is like move perfect. You have to really pay attention to what you're doing and where all the good matches are. I don't know how any kid could beat this. You can't make any moves that are going to leave good tiles open on your opponent's turn. And if you slip up for even one move, there's almost no way to make a comeback. In fact, I remember my mom would actually play this part of the game on her own quite a bit. And the only reason she went and bought a standalone Mahjong computer game was because she got tired of Mushu, who keeps talking periodically. They could have just released this by itself and it would have justified the price. It's the best part of any of these games. It's so much fun, I could seriously sit here and play this for hours. Wasn't I in the middle of something? Oh right, the video! If you do ever manage to stop playing Mahjong and see the rest of the game, you go through the Tung Shao Pass, and then it's time for the last scene in the Imperial City. Here, you have to actually knock out the Huns yourself by throwing watermelons at them. Quick, throw it at the Huns on the stair! So now, not only are you filling the story back in, but you're rewriting the course of history itself. Remember that part of the Mulan legend where a disembodied hand took out the entire Hun army by pelting them with gourds? Once you complete the story, you unlock the Story Studio, which is a little art type activity where you can create scenes from prefab art assets and attempt to color them with a paint bucket tool. But these images clearly weren't designed to be colored in this way, and it looks pretty terrible. The real reward, though, is that if you click on the little bird icon, it takes you to a music player where you get to sing along with one of the best songs in Disney history. These are pretty good. Even though they were simple, I had a lot of fun with them as a kid, just seeing what new things I could find to click on each time I played. And more than anything, I think they really did help me feel comfortable when it came to using computers. Maybe experimenting with these games is what taught me to be so resourceful when it came to figuring out different types of software, so I could do things like teach myself how to edit videos at a young age. In any case, though, that's all we have time for today, so check in for part two where we'll take a look at some of Disney Interactive's straight-up edutainment titles. Now, how do I end this video? That little ball in the corner can be a big help. To learn more about it, just click the question mark twice. Fine.
If you're sure you want to leave, click on Slinky. If you don't want to leave, click on Ham. Okay, bye. See you soon.